Namaskaram Sadhguru. Namaskaram to every one of you. On behalf of the entire medical pharmaceutical fraternity of our country, I'd like to thank you immensely for this interaction at such a short notice. No, 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 this is not a time to thank me. We all bow down to you for the service that you are doing, all of you, the medical fraternity. Thank you very much. Of course, we have doctors, nurses, paramedics, management from various government and private hospitals, distributors, and many employees of pharmaceutical organizations and hospitals live on this seminar, this, on this webinar this evening. Sadhguru, as you know, healthcare professionals and scientists around the world are working incredibly hard to defend humanity against this virus. We are today seeking your blessings and words of inspiration at this critical time. We also have some fellow panelists whom you know, many of them. Next to me is Raghuram. Namaskaram. Namaskaram. Sangeeta from Apollo. Namaskaram. And we have... Uh, Hello, Sangeeta. How are you? <laughs> Fine. Thank you, Sadhguru. Very nice to see you, Sadhguru. Dr. Srinath Reddy has recorded a question for you. And uh, we have a sister from one of the COVID hospitals, Sister Kazia Narani, uh, who's working live Namaskaram. at a COVID hospital, joining us. So... Uh, I have a question to start this conversation and then we can take uh, questions from the panelists. As a community, we are all, we are all approaching COVID as a very serious and a very highly infectious disease. With what we love, know from the medical science and what we are learning every day through the experience of people around the world. We are familiar with the science and developments. However, you know, we are facing an unprecedented situation. And to face this situation, we need the science and we need the expertise, but we also need inner strength and fortitude. And this is where I seek your perspectives and how each of us can be better prepared in these aspects of building our inner strength, our calm to deal with the current situation. Over to you, Sadhguru. Namaskaram to everyone who is… Uh, uh, who logged in who are online. Namaskaram to all the doctors and nurses. Well, it is at times like this, uh, what sort of human beings we are becomes extremely important. When I say what sort of human beings, well, we are referred to as human beings, not as human creatures but as human beings. Because in terms of evolution, compared to all the other creatures, we are supposed to know how to be. Well, many human beings are striving to disappoint the expectations of nature <laughs> to prove that we don't know how to be. But uh, this is what it means, being a human being means that we can function consciously, especially when challenging situations are ahead of us. These are really challenging times. Probably for this generation, we have never before faced uh, such a, a global situation where it threatens everybody. So, it, these are definitely challenging times for every one of us. Well, about uh, how uh, we have the necessary strength to address this. See, it's always like this, if I have to quote somebody, Gautama, the Buddha said, when uh, people, you know, his monks came to him and uh, complaining about small things, this and that, because pe for people on the spiritual path in those days, food was one of the biggest challenges because they don't organize their own food, they seek it from the society. We fortunately had a society which would always contribute towards this. But still, uh, Gautama created too many monks and there was always a food issue because suddenly three thousand, four thousand monks end up in a new city or a town of those days. So that would be a stress on the local uh, population, so there would be many issues. So Gautama said one thing, which, uh, you know, which I came in touch with very early on in my life and uh, in a way, uh, this one thing stood by me in a huge way. 
He said, when you're very hungry, if you give away your food to someone else, when you're very hungry and you badly need it, at that time, if you give it away, you will not become weak, you will become way stronger. I think this one thing has stood by me always right through my life <laughs> It is not that I live by slogans or morals, but when I look back and see, somehow this I came across when I was just sixteen or seventeen, it uh, struck me in a big way. And as uh, uh, Prasad Guru, you know, my father, he's a medical person. And uh, because he was uh, in Indian railways and always there would be some emergencies and things, uh, small hospitals with, uh, you know, twenty-five, fifty beds where uh, he was used to be the in-charge person most of the time. Any time of the day or night, some emergency would come. This was something always we witnessed at home, which had a serious influence on me, that he would be halfway through the meal and the moment the phone rings, he would just wash his hands right there in the plate and just go away. My mother would beg him just two minutes, just finish the meal and go, but he always left. Somehow this thing about leaving his meal halfway and going away became a big uh, image in me that I thought this was the greatest thing about him always, that it doesn't matter what he is doing, where he is, the moment the call came, he just left as if that was the only thing that mattered. Uh, there used to be controversies and discussions at home, his mother always saying, this is crazy, why can't you finish your meal and go, why can't you do this and go? But he always left, within a minute's time he would be dressed and gone. So, having said that, I'm sure many of you doctors are doing similar things in your life. So, this is a time where we must be above our personal needs and requirements. Probably every… many of you live like this every… every day of your life. This is how we live here also, though we are not attending to medical emergencies. The strength of life, how strong and powerful your life is, simply depends on this, that you have placed everybody's well-being well above your own comforts and pleasures and, uh, you know, even your own well-being at many times. When you do this, there is a powerful atmosphere around you. This is an atmosphere where uh, I'm saying for many of you with your families, this is a kind of atmosphere that your children should grow up in because that had such a powerful impact on me. And I'm sure that will have such a powerful impact on your children especially at a time like this, you displaying that you are placing everybody's well-being way above your… your own, I think is going to be the greatest influence that you have on your children and the people around you. Above all, the nation is in huge appreciation of uh, what the medical personnel are doing right now and it will definitely have a huge impact on the nation itself. This itself should be a great strength for you uh, that, you know, what you're doing is beyond yourself. Thank you very much for that uh, very in, in, uh, inspirational answer that you gave us. Uh, Raghuram, whom you know is the president of the um, Association of Surgeons of India and is a very famous oncologist. Uh, he has a question for you, Sadhguru. Namaskaram, Raghu. <laughs> At the very outset, on behalf of the uh, medical fraternity in this country. I've just seen the video clip, which is a touching tribute, which shows how the frontline personnel, whilst placing their lives at risk, are working relentlessly uh, towards treating, serving and saving many lives. Uh, you'll be very pleased to know, Sadhguru, that the Association of Surgeons of India, which is the voice for the surgical fraternity in the country, over the last few days, we have raised a sum of more than one crore by championing a pan-India initiative to procure the much-needed personal protection equipment, uh, which we are providing to the healthcare professionals across the country. Despite rising to the occasion, there have been many reports of violence, abuse and vigilantism against the fraternity. And you must have seen our Honorable Prime Minister on at least three occasions in the past three weeks has brought this issue up and asked people to be more responsible. And as the President of the 
world's second largest surgical association i am deeply concerned at the manner in which a section of the citizenry are uh, really becoming un uh, insensitive and cruel uh, in many ways so sadguru this is demoralized or demoralizing the medical profession uh, on a daily basis so at times of crisis like this this is a time for reflection and change and what do you think that uh, uh, we should be learning the humanity should be learning uh, uh, during the troubled times like this thank you uh rogo i very much understand the uh, concern and it's most unfortunate that certain sections of people have done this but i think uh, most administrations have clamped down quite strongly against uh, that kind of reactions from people certain religious beliefs and other things has made this happen and some people out of their uh, selfish uh, motives within apartment houses and all they've done a few things like that but i think as a fraternity you should not focus on this minuscule population which does these nasty things 99.9% of the people in the country are right now uh, seeing you as worship worthy that is where your focus should be that minuscule population which unfortunately behaves that way uh, yes that also must be dealt with by law very strongly i would say those people who have attacked medical personnel during these times must be dealt with a very strong hand i think the government is determined to do that as far as i can see so that will happen anyway but you must focus on the uh, for the probably for the first time in the history of this nation the largest number of people are looking at medical professionals with a completely different light they are not seeing you as professionals they are seeing you as an immense service that you are rendering to the society so let us focus on that let's not give strength to this minuscule population which does these nasty things yes uh, that must be controlled and i'm sure uh, right now largely it has been put down wherever it rose uh, there may be some, some small pockets which are still like that but they have been entire communities have been quarantined to control and regulate these things so law will take care of that and uh, right now as you see uh, both the central government and most of the state governments are acting in a very determined way against this kind of uh, crimes having said that if i can uh, if i can take the liberty of telling you a small story you know my great grandmother was a very good storyteller she said many stories in great detail this one story stuck with me and uh, though i remember all of them but this one thing was uh, kind of I was probably uh, maybe four and a half, five years of age when she told this story to me, but uh, this story kind of lived with me. Uh, there was a man who was a farmer and uh, he had a little bit of land and doing agriculture. Then he got two sons, the sons grew up, they cleared more land and they became well-to-do farmers. And uh, when his time of passing came, he called both the sons and told them whatever comes out of this land do not divide the land but whatever comes out of this land both of you share it equally 50 50% they agreed one of the boys married had five children over a period of time and the other boy never married but still 50 50 it was going so the elder boy who was married with children one day you know got a little worm in his head and then he thought i have a wife and five children i am getting 50% he is alone and he is getting 50% but i have my boys growing up when i get old they will take care of me who will take care of my brother he should get little more so that he has more wealth in his old age but he is very proud he will not take anything from me so in the night he would uh, pack a bag of grains and stealthily go towards his brother's uh, storehouse and put these grains there every night a little bit and the same worm got into the other brother's head one day and he thought i am just alone i get 50% my brother has the burden of wife and five children but he also gets 50% but if i offer anything he won't take it 
So he also started packing a bag and putting it in his other brother's storehouse. So this reverse osmosis went on without anybody's knowledge for quite a few years. Then in their old age, one day both of them carrying a bag and coming in the… you know, in the darkness of the night, they bumped into each other. They looked at each other and they realized what they have been doing. They looked away from each other, very embarrassed about their own generosity and anyway dumped the uh, grain where they have to and came back. After some time they died, they passed on. The townspeople were wanting to build a temple and uh, they were looking for a site. After much search, they decided the best place to build the temple is that place where be these… both these brothers came with these bags carrying, you know, they were old men by then, carrying these heavy bags on their backs, they came and they realized what they were doing and they were very embarrassed with their own generosity and they looked away from each other but continued their activity. They said, this is the best place to build a temple. So, when we place… when we place others' well-being ab above our own well-being and we are not thumping our chests about what we have done, we are embarrassed about our own generosity, that's a… that's like a temple. So this is why I said, when you place other people's well-being above your own, you become worship-worthy. In fact, what people are trying to worship is just this. Why do you think they're going to the temple and calling for gods that they have not seen? Simply because they believe God places their well-being above his own. And that's the reason why he's become worship-worthy. If he says, what about me? I don't think anybody will go to the temple or any place <laughs> So, right now you are uh, rising in your stature, do not focus on these negative things. In many ways, as it should be, uh, a teacher or a doctor or, uh, you know, ad many other people who serve every day the society, they must all become worship-worthy. It's very, very important and it's beginning to happen. Let us fuel that, let's not focus on this small, minuscule percentage of population doing negative things. Our uh, next question is from uh, Sangeeta, a real leader in the… In this whole battle against this virus and a very uh, charming and uh, delightful disciple. Oh, she can kill any virus, I know. <laughs> I… I truly wish I could, Sadhguru. <laughs> you know, we wouldn't be sitting like this if it were, but uh, thank you for saying that. You… you give us strength. But… but what you said earlier also was so tremendous, Sadhguru, and thank you so much for… for being with us, for inspiring us. Uh, whether you're in front of us or not, we always gain strength from you. So, in the… this thing of strength, Sadhguru, I think all of us are faced with some really tough questions these days. And um, the other day I actually, you know, wore an N95 mask and went into the COVID uh, hospital. We have an isolated hospital for these patients because I said, uh, is it fair to put our nurses and our doctors at risk and take a risk that I wouldn't do myself? And I mean, I know I had no medical role there except to rev up their spirits a bit. But I think it's this kind of decision-making for leaders. And now I think the Prime Minister is faced with this decision, do we extend the lockdown from the medical safety aspect or do we lift it from the economic aspect? And I mean, I'm not seeking answers to these, but a framework for taking difficult decisions, which all of us are facing so much in our lives. About decision-making, well, uh, Sangeeta, you are in a position of leadership for long enough, you know this and I'm sure most of you know this, but anyway. See, when it comes to decision-making at the leadership level, this idea of what is the perfect decision, we must keep it down a little bit. We need to understand whichever way we decide, we're going to hurt something and we're going to make something good. We'll do something good and we'll do something bad with every decision we take when large-scale situations are involved. There is no perfect decision as such to make. So if we come to terms with this, only then we will make correct decisions, otherwise we'll just get emotional about the situation and inevitably we will not be able to take the right decisions. So when we take any decision in such a large-scale situation, there is not going to be a perfect situation. It's a perfect decision rather. 
Just now you mentioned about the Prime Minister has to take a call whether to continue the uh, lockdown or not. I think uh, it's been largely decided to continue except relaxing a few activities, which is a good thing to do. And everybody knows, the data shows, the science shows that a lockdown is a must in a nation of this kind of density of population. But the economic pain also has to be taken into consideration, you can't just close down the country. So, where this is the… this is the uh, privilege and pain and power of being a leader, that when you make decisions, you know all the aspects and you do what is in larger good. So you know that you cannot do absolute good. This is something that we must come to terms with, otherwise we cannot make the right decisions. Right decision is not a perfect decision. Right decision is the best thing to do in the given moment, but not a perfect decision because there is no such thing. Nobody can make a perfect decision. It is not personal life to make one perfect decision. When so many people's lives are involved, we will have to make hard decisions. When we say hard decisions, many things are against, you know, the fundamental nature. Our own hearts will not agree with it, but we still have to make those decisions in the interest of the larger good. And that's the only way forward and leaders should have the strength and the uh, balance and the determination to do what is for the larger good, rather than deciding things by our own sensitivities that we have. Thank you, Sadhguru. Thank you. Thank you, Sagita, and thank you, Sadhguru. Uh, we have a video message and a question from our Honorable Health Minister, Harshwardhanji. Uh, we'll play the video and then uh, uh, we will await your answer, Sadhguruji. Mm -hmm. Sadhguruji, I would like to seek your kind permission to raise a very important and pertinent issue today at this prestigious forum, where I am told that thousands of my medical fraternity friends are present and they are hearing me. In the context of COVID-19 pandemic and in the context of how lakhs and lakhs of frontline health workers are passionately and selflessly working day and night to save our fellow citizens, I outrightly condemned the recent attacks on them. I consider this most unfortunate, especially since it is happening in a country like India and more so since it is happening in my tenure as the health minister of the country. Our doctors, our nurses and our paramedics and all those involved in COVID-19 care and treatment are our real warriors, they are our COVID warriors. They are putting their life in danger to serve the nation and all of us. I also unequivocally condemn the ostracization and stigmatization of doctors and health workers by some selfish people in our society. I must tell you that our government stands fully in support of frontline health workers. Time and again, our beloved Prime Minister Shri Narendra Modi ji has spoken out against the violence that is taking place against doctors. He has appealed to the nation to protect our medical personnel. Modi ji has even equated them with God. The Home Ministry has taken cognizance of such incidents and has advised the authorities to take stringent action under the National Security Act. Now our doctors and health warriors should work without fear as the government is standing in all its strength with them. Doctors, nurses and all healthcare workers deserve our respect, support and cooperation to keep the fight going. We have advised all state governments to take appropriate action against those who are indulging in violence, be it the landlords who are evicting doctors and their families. Most respected Sadhguruji, I appeal through you to the country that we must all stand united in this unprecedented crisis that humanity is facing today. Let us give utmost respect to all those who are working to save our lives. 
Many thanks for giving me this opportunity. My highest regards. My namaskarams to uh, Harshwardhan ji. Uh, well, uh, I'm really uh, impressed by the resoluteness with which the government has acted. For a nation like India with such a massive population and density of population and the complexity of our population, the decisive way in which the government went forward is very important. The entire world is appreciating this right now. This is a decision most developed countries could not take in time. But uh, we have taken this. So, s not attacking the doctors is uh, not even a thing, it must be put down with the heaviest possible hand that the home ministry or the local administration should. I think that is being done. Having said that, it's disgraceful that somebody even thought of attacking people who came to save your life. It is most disgraceful upon all of us. But supporting the doctors is not only by not attacking them or cooperating with, uh, with them, the most important thing is to, le to reduce the level of stress that the medical infrastructure in the country is going through is the most important thing is that all of us maintain social distancing, ensure that I don't get the infection and in case I do get the infection, I make sure it does not go to the next person. Just by doing this, we will be serving the medical community in a huge way that we can reduce the level of load and stress on them by simply making sure that you do not get the virus and in case Unfortunately, if you do get it for somehow, ensure it doesn't move from you to another person. If we do this, we will be serving the medical community in a big way at this time. There is no nation in the world which has a medi medical infrastructure to handle people at this scale. You are seeing what's happening in United States which has such a massive medical infrastructure, in spite of that they become totally helpless simply because no nation is geared to handle a pandemic of this proportion. Definitely India is not there at all and we cannot do that, that we can prepare a nation to treat 1.4 billion people at a time. There is no such infrastructure, it's not possible to create that infrastructure. It is only with citizens' cooperation and involvement that it is possible that we can come out victorious in this war against this virus. I'm using the word war because uh, in a way, this needs to be conducted at a w in a war footing. This is a, an invisible enemy, you can't shoot him e because uh, it is all in human beings. <laughs> if it was somewhere else, we would have sprayed this chemical, that chemical, all these things, but it is residing in human beings. So, the only thing that… the most responsible thing we can do is to ensure that you don't get it. And in case you get it, ensure it doesn't go to another person. If we do this, we'll be doing a great service to the medical fraternity and uh, to the nation itself. This is a time where everybody has the opportunity to serve the nation by simply doing nothing <laughs> Please make use of this opportunity, everybody. Thank you once again. Um, the next question is from Dr. Srinath Reddy, uh, President of the Public Health Foundation of India. Uh, he has recorded his question and sent it in, which we will play it now. Namaste, Sadhguru. While all the people who are heroically battling to save lives in hospitals need our highest praise and gratitude, 85% of the people who will suffer from COVID would need to be treated at home or near home in primary healthcare settings. What's your message to the people who are battling at the front lines, like ASHAs, auxiliary nurse midwives, persons doing the contact tracing, and others performing various public health functions that will actually win this battle for us. So these uh, self-help groups, Anganwadis and others who are uh, at the rural level and uh, small uh, town level who are working on the thing, who are not are fully qualified medical personnel who have more knowledge about these things. Such people protecting them, above all giving them the necessary protective gear 
gear so that they feel confident to step out, that they don't feel like sacrifice the lambs, that they're being sacrificed for somebody else's well-being. It is very, very important that we have to ensure that they have the necessary protective gear and uh, their lives should not be sacrificed uh, in the name of service. Service is fine, but there is no need to sacrifice lives for uh, this purpose. So, without protective gear, this could happen. So, uh, if uh, the medical experts that many of you are, it's not necessary, only this imported gear should come. I'm sure we can come up with various our own jugards to ensure that it can be produced in large numbers and given to this level of workers so that uh, their lives are not at risk. Providing this is very important because many of them, uh, the Ashas and others are largely women and uh, they have their own families and children. So if they are coming out even to serve, that at a time like this they're reporting to their duty itself is a fantastic thing. This must be honored with the necessary protective gear and a kind of an assurance that their lives are safe. The glasses that are needed, the masks that are needed and the protective cover for the body that is needed must be provided in large scale. Uh, I know it's a challenge for the country. This is why industry, business and organized institutions like us, everybody should jump into this and do as much as we can to ensure that this... Uh, not the doctors and nurses who definitely know much more about these infections, but lower down health workers who may not be as medically qualified or capable, they must be protected. So this is the duty of the nation and the citizens to take care of this. We can make an appeal that if... Uh, if someone gives me uh, a number, what is the kind of number of uh, ashas and others are there, mm, we can make a large-scale appeal and maybe somebody... I don't know, even prime minister can make an appeal, each one of us contribute at least for one person's gear what it takes so that they can go out and serve fearlessly. This is a duty that's upon the country and we must fulfill this. Thank you, Sadhguru. Um, the next question is really from a frontline nurse who's actually in the COVID ward right now. And you can see that she's fully geared up. Sister Kazia Rani, please ask her question. Namaskaram. I'm Kazia, working as a nurse at infectious disease ward of Apollo Hospitals, Hyderabad and taking care of COVID patients. We are privileged to work in Apollo. We have enough of PPE, policies, support and care. We all are ready to fight this battle, but I'm extremely sad and concerned what is happening in the world due to this deadly virus. The situation is very scary. The whole world is suffering with the deadly virus. However, we all healthcare workers are committed and we will do our best. We understand that there is a risk, but still, we want to take care of our sufferers and come out as a winner. It is also known many of our colleagues have acquired COVID while taking care of patients, which is very painful. On behalf of our team, I would like to ask you one question. My question is, how do we keep ourselves motivated and continue with a positive status of mind to fight with this painful scenario? Thank you. Namaskaram, Kazia. Uh, first of all, well, uh, we cannot see your face right now, but right now, anybody who is dressed like this, in people's experience, largely, I'm saying the largest number of people in the country, if you're dressed like this, they have begun to see you godlike because they know you're standing up for their lives. So, this will not go in vain. Uh, by the time this crisis is over, I think the entire uh, status and value of what it means to be a medical professional, because slowly uh, over a period of time, people have lost this... You know, there was a time a doctor or a nurse was seen as a life savior, but over a period of time, because our minds have become so commercial, people think it's just one more profession, what is the big deal? They're paid, so they'll do it. But this is a time, by the time this virus uh, situation is over, whatever amount of time it takes, you will see that the medical profession will sit on a pedestal that it deserves to sit. And uh, 
every doctor, every nurse, ensure once we put you up there, don't come down, you must stay there. You must stay on that pedestal because it is needed, because on… because a whole lot of things that you do are not absolutes. Medical treatment is not an absolute. What an absolute… perfect treatment, if you give to one person, that person will live, the same perfect treatment may kill another person. So it is not an absolute, life is not an absolute like that. So when it is like this, trust and faith in the medical profession is very, very vital so that you can serve fearlessly not only in these times but at any time. So do not focus on the negative aspect of whatever little things have happened. If you count those instances, hardly it is a dozen instances across the country. So do not empower those people. Please, please respect this that right now people are looking at you. If you're just dressed like this, we don't know who you are, we don't know whether you're a medical professional or not. If you are dressed like this, people are bowing down and clapping their hands in towns and cities. So you must understand the very stature of being a nurse or a doctor is going up in a massive way in people's minds and hearts and this is very important for you to deliver your services not only during this virus period, but even later for you to fearlessly do what you think is right without wondering what will be the consequence of this is uh, very important and this situation will definitely render the national situation there that people will respect you and regard you for who you are and for the most significant service in terms of uh, people's lives because uh, Every other service is only relevant if people are alive. If I am alive only, then all the other services are meaningful to me. The most important thing is that I am alive and that's true for every human being. So please, uh, I want you also to understand, people are with you, people are looking up to you and uh, there is a great sense of appreciation and uh, you know, uh, a very, very profound sense of appreciation in people's minds and hearts. You can see this everywhere around us. Please uh, accept our respects, though we can't see you, someday I would like to see you without a mask <laughs> Thank you for giving me this opportunity, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sadhguru, we're getting a lot of uh, questions from doctors across the country. I'll pick a few in the interest of time. Uh, and for a, from a patterns that I see in these questions, they're all about how to manage themselves, their emotions, uh, their helplessness. They're seeing situations where uh, the facilities are inadequate uh, for treating people uh, and they're not able to react fast enough. And this is causing a lot of turmoil within them and they want to manage their own emotions. Uh, there's something you can help, help them, you know, in terms of how they manage their tranquility emotions uh, to deal with the current situation, it would be very useful. As I said earlier, this is a war-like situation. During a war, when uh, casualties come and pile up, you know, like uh, injuries and other things come and pile up, most of the time during wars, doctors have to make a decision whom to save and whom to let them die. This is a very hard decision to make for anybody because you can… it's, a, it's much easier to make a decision about my own life, but it's very hard to make a decision about somebody else's life. How do you decide whether that person should live or die? But unfortunately, such decisions have to be made in warlike situation. As it has happened in New York City, for example, if you take New York State as a nation, what is happening there, if that happens, that kind of percentage scales happen in India, then every one of you will have to make very hard decisions. Who should live, who should die? This kind of decisions will come into your hands. Uh, it is very unfortunate, but you must be ready for that. You must understand this, you must place yourself in this place. You are not going to make perfect decisions, as I said earlier, you just have to very clearly set yourself up, you will make the best possible decision, always in the interest of what is happening to the patient, always in the interest of what is happening to the larger situation around you, but never in personal interest. If you make this one decision, 
you will be very clear and balanced and easy to handle these things. Physical hardship and the challenge of day and night work, all these things are there, but at least your conscience will be clear. If you make this one thing clear, absolutely clear within yourself, every step I take, every breath I take, every action I do is in the interest of the people who are there, who trust me and who are there in front of me. If this one decision is absolutely made in your hearts and minds, uh, you will come to some ease, but this does not mean these are easy times, these are challenging times. There's another question, a more practical question. This is Dr. Prabhat Kumar. He's asking me if Sadhguru has any recommendations for a dietary regime which will help us build our immunity and lower the chances of catching this virus and dealing with it. See, there are many traditional things uh, which we can do to, uh, you know, boost our immunity. I, at a time like this, uh, I don't want to go into large… much detail, but if you want details, we can send it to you. But to put it very briefly, uh, uh, as, <laughs> as those of you who know me know this, that, uh, you know, the last thirty-nine years that I'm in… in the… in this uh, public life, Almost every day I have some public event, some event which I am committed to large groups of people. But in these thirty-nine years, in all this travel, I have not cancelled a single event because I am not well. This doesn't mean that I am not well at all, because all this travel you catch this infection, that infection happens here and there, but it doesn't put me down because… definitely because of the immune system, in the yogic Sciences, there are various things one can do to enhance one's immune system. In terms of practices, which are hard to teach right now, but we have put out a very… a simple, uh, powerful process called uh, Simha Kriya, which… Uh, the video of which, uh, very simple to do, is we will send it to you so that you can put it out to your doctors and nurses. This is a kind of process, one thing is it will boost the immune system. Another thing is, it is… it involves your breath in a certain way. Suppose you start doing it today, after a week's time, if you find some difficulty in doing it, you clearly know you have some respiratory stuff, even before other symptoms show up. Even before other symptoms with which you normally medically recognize, even before that you will see you will not be able to do the practice the moment there is some kind of a respiratory cause. Uh, this viral being… you know, being a, a very respiratory-related uh, thing, it'll be very useful if you're doing the practice every day, twice a day, it'll boost the immune system, but at the same time, it will uh, tell you it's like a gauge. If you suddenly can't do it one day, you know there is something wrong with your uh, function of your respiratory system. It is… and also one more thing is, right now for all the medical personnel, doctors and nurses, we are offering inner engineering online, free of cost. So anybody can log in and do this, uh, the platform has been set up for this purpose. Normally, this… Uh, internationally what we offer, it costs about hundred fifty dollars per person, but this is being offered free for all the doctors and nurses. This will also help because this is about the way you think and way you feel, you can bring a certain amount of balance and control by doing the inner engineering online pr program. I request all the doctors and nurses to make use of it, it's free of cost. And there are also other processes on our app one can make use of to bring balance. But uh, about boosting the immune system, I'm saying bringing balance and bringing a sense of exuberance in the system is very vital for boosting immune system. I don't know how allopathic system of medicine looks at it, but in the yogic system, we always see the most important thing for you to get healthy is that you are exuberant and joyful in the way you are. So, for this purpose there are many aspects and when it comes to food, the simple thing that we do when… Uh, when we see that we are exposed to infections when we're traveling, if there is… Uh, if we see there are viral infections or influenza going on, uh, all these years of my visits to United States, I don't catch influenza when it's running rampantly all over. The simple thing is just this, hot water, a little bit of honey, little bit of turmeric and uh, if uh, it is possible, 
some pudina or coriander in it a little bit. And every three hours if you drink it, respiratory infections won't happen to you because first they have a tendency... I'm sorry, I'm saying all this to the doctors <laughs> but this is how we understand. If I am wrong, please point it out. We believe that all these infections first lodge themselves in your throat and then they go into the respiratory tract. But if you drink these substances, warm water with honey, turmeric and coriander or uh, pudina, then that goes into the stomach bag and there they are not very effective. They can't cause much damage to you. So like this, every three hours if you... those of you who are in the hospitals like this, if the hospital itself can provide that, it'll be great. Right now, this is what we are doing to all the police personnel and the medical personnel in our region. We are uh, providing them what is called as Nila Vembu Kashayam, which works very well. We did this across Tamil Nadu when the dengue fever was on, it made a big difference. These kind of things can be done to boost the immune system. In all the hospitals, uh, if it is kept there with warm water and this, that medical personnel can drink every few hours instead of drinking just plain water. If they just drink this as a part of their thing, I think it will definitely help. It has helped me in from the... I'm just telling you grandmother stuff, not medical stuff, okay? But it's worked. It worked for my grandmother, it worked for me <laughs> Thank you so much. Practical wisdom and that's why we all admire you so much. Um, you started the talk with saying that we are human beings and we are beings and not creatures. Um, as beings, as we see this uh, situation in which there is an imbalance between nature and us, uh, and you see this, we see this virus as something just caused by this Im imbalance. Uh, do you have a perspective on us as a human race where we have gone wrong, what can we do out of this big lesson that we are being uh, given by nature today? See, it'll be very cruel for uh, those who are infected, who are fighting for their life, and those who lost their dear ones, to tell them nature is teaching you a lesson. It'll be very cruel to say that, I will not say such things, but this is something I've been speaking for last twenty, twenty-five years. One important thing is the human population. I know a whole lot of people will get against me. All the religious groups, all the major religions are against me because of this one statement and many others. See, the nature of human population, the way it's growing, in the beginning of twentieth century, we were only 1.6 billion people. Today we are inching towards eight billion people. And the amount of things that we can do because of technological capabilities has multiplied. What hundred people would do and consume a hundred years ago, today one person is consuming that much in terms of uh, ecological consumption. So having said that, if we do not consciously control our population, Nature will do it in a cruel way. Is nature thinking that it must punish us? No, it is a natural consequence because life is enmeshed into each other. It is not like my life and the virus's life are two separate lives. My life and millions of bacteria and virus and everything is interlinked. Plants, animals, microorganisms, we are all enmeshed as one life. So, when we create too much of an imbalance, naturally certain things will happen. That correction is not even a conscious correction from nature or somebody wanting to punish us, inevitably it happens. For example, this is... I'm not talking science, I'm just talking simple common sense, please uh, see it as that. For example, right now, a virus which was living in animal kingdom has jumped into human beings. However, it happened, there are many theories, I don't want to go into that, but it's happened. Now, if we want to look at it this way, the virus also wants to live as we want to live. Actu actually, if you look at our relationship with the planet, we are like virus on the planet, causing serious damage to everything on this planet. We are the virus, actually. So similarly, virus wants to live but its habitat is going down. The number of animals in which it might have been living hundred years ago and how many animals it has to live today, their habitat might have come down severely. So naturally they're exploring new habitat. 
And uh, because we are the big number right now, it is moved into us. There are not enough tigers, there are not enough pangolins, there are not enough bats maybe in the world, so it's come to us. And uh, now it has learned to live in us. So it is affecting us severely because virus is just trying to live. Virus is not trying to kill us. Virus is not trying to give us a fever. Virus is just trying to live. But it lives so virulently that we are getting all these symptoms and we are dying out of it. This is because our system is not strong enough as a pangolin system to handle this virus. This is my uh, simple sense about it. So, this is inevitably bound to happen because all these other microorganisms that may be surviving in wild animals, definitely their habitat has shrunk very, very badly. So, naturally they will have a tendency to jump wherever there is a possibility for them to thrive. And human population is definitely the target. So, in that context, See, for the kind of lifestyles we are living, the kind of consumption that all of us have, the kind of aspirations that we have in the world, we must strive to reduce the population consciously. If we don't do it, nature will do it in some way. It is inevitably bound to happen one way or the other and it will be very cruel. Whichever way it happens, it will be very cruel when it is done to us. But if we do it consciously, that will be a sensible way to do because we are human beings. We are supposed to conduct everything consciously. In… Uh, this does not mean it is happening necessarily because of excessive reproduction. It is just that people are living longer, which is a wonderful thing. For example, in India, the average life expectancy in this country in 1947 was 28 years. Today, I think it's reached some 73 or 74, which is a fantastic achievement for this nation. Thanks to all of you also, because you have a significant role in this. Thanks to all the vaccines and various other things. Otherwise, most of us who are right now on the screen shouldn't be alive, according to those averages. None of us should be alive, actually. But we are alive today thanks to that. So, human beings should live a full life. But now, when we live a full life, it also becomes important that when we postpone the death, we must postpone the birth. I'm not talking any philosophy, just simple arithmetic. If we postpone the death, we must postpone the birth also. That is also happening. Women who are normally de started to deliver the first baby by sixteen, seventeen years of age, hundred years ago, today it's gone to some twenty-four years or something, some average like that. But it needs to move further up, otherwise, if you put every person of the female uh, the gender into education process and their education lasts for twenty-three, twenty-four years of age, then naturally it'll get pushed, that needs to happen. Still, a large percentage of them are not going into full educational process, which is why the childbirth is happening much earlier. We have to push it. If we don't push it, nature will do it in its own way. Right now it's happening. It is a calamity only for the human being. I'm sure the virus is happy. Maybe the animals are also happy. I can see that's happening all around us. Only human beings are unhappy. So, we must do something consciously because we are the only creatures who can rise above our instincts and function consciously. Whether it's life or death, both we can handle consciously. This we must exercise as human beings. Thank you so much, uh, Sadhguru. Uh, with this, we are coming to the end. Uh, any final words for, for all the people that are on the show and looking for guidance from you? My congratulations and uh, blessings to all the medical personnel because India stands out in the way we have handled it. Compared to any other nation with massive infrastructures, compared to infra medical infrastructure in India, those nations, European nations and America has massive medical infrastructure, many fold over. In spite of that, we have handled it extremely well. Our uh, fatality rates are very, very low. Thanks to every one of you, as I said, do not focus on those few negative incidents. I'm telling you, by the end of this virus, uh, you know, the season is over for us, or this uh, threat or this challenging time is over, uh, the medical personnel, people who look like her, who dress like her, will become worship-worthy, and that is how it should be. Thank you very much for having me with you. 
uh, in whichever way we can serve you, we're always available to you. Please reach out if there is something we can do for you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Sadhguru. Namaskar.